the MMA Fight Corner. We are live on Fox Sports Radio 920 in Las Vegas and on world worldwide on UFCRadio.com. I am Heidi Fang. I'm joined today by Joey Varner and Phil Devine. And we have to give a shout out to our sponsor, Dr. Richard Rothman of Lee in Nevada. We also have a very special guest in studio today, UFC lightweight Danny Last Call Castillo. He's coming off a huge win over Paul Sass and is set to face Bobby Green at UFC on Fox 8. Everyone, thanks for joining in. We have an awesome show lined up, and we're ready to get to this tough 17 finale going down at the Mandalay Bay this weekend. Guys, the main event, Uriah Faber, Last Call's own training partner there, and he'll be facing his old... I guess former training teammate, uh, Scott Jorgensen. What do you guys think about this fight? Uh, I, I just got to say, let's be honest, we're really psyched for this. I'm sure everybody here is psyched for tomorrow's event. The Ultimate Fighter, the best season we've ever had. Two really tough guys fighting in the finale, and you got a main event of Scott Jorgensen and Uriah Faber. Dude, it's going to be fireworks. I'm excited. Yeah, uh, I, I'm juiced for this fight. Anytime the, the lighter weights fight, the 55s, 45s, 35s, now 25s, I get stoked because the pace, the energy, the skill level, they're all so well-rounded and they fight non-stop from minute one to the last, from the bell, from when the bell dings in the first round to when it dings to end in the last round. It's non-stop action. Uh, Uriah Faber and Scotty Jorgensen, it, when I look at this fight, I think, you know, Uriah is so good everywhere. He's so well-rounded. You know, he's striking, he's explosive, he's fast, he's in and out. He's got great wrestling, great submission, great cardio. He's been in how many five-round fights? And when you look at this guy's records, he's only lost in title fights. What does that tell you about this person, you know? He is a champion in and out of the ring. Scotty Jorgensen, he's all heart. He comes from the same background as Uriah. He's a wrestler first, and he's really advanced his striking game. Got good knockout power, you know, in and out movement, light on his toes. This fight's going to be fireworks. Danny, what are your thoughts on this fight? I mean, did you at all work with them at Team Alpha Male when Jorgensen was in the mix? I mean, he credited Uriah quite highly for getting him involved at the level that he is with mixed martial arts. Yeah, I'm really excited about this fight. Uh, anytime my teammate, well, anytime Uriah steps in the cage, um, he, he's exciting. He's never been in a boring fight. Um, uh, like what was said earlier, um, his last three, I mean, his three losses were to Dominic Cruz, uh, Burrell, and Aldo, and I think uh, only three other guys have, you know, they have three losses combined total in their careers. Um, I think I read something in their the three fighters that he lost to are something like seven, 72 and 3. Something really crazy like that. Uriah comes to fight every time, and I guarantee he won't disappoint. Scotty's a friend. Um, I haven't trained with him in, in a really long time. I think the last time I trained with him was here in Vegas um, uh, at, at Tap Out. So, uh, you know, it's a been it's been a while, maybe two years. Um, but uh, I love Scotty. I love his parents, and um, it's going to be a good fight. It, it sucks to see two friends fight. But at the end of the day, I mean, someone needs to get up there to get that title. And, um, you know, I think both those guys need to fight each other in order to see who's second best in the weight class. And a lot of times it's the, the friend fights that are the most exciting, that just turn out to be the biggest wars, the back and forth battles, the battles of attrition, you know. So it, it, it's, it sucks when you got to fight your friend, but a lot of times the results are awesome for the fans. Yeah, and the last time we saw Uriah fight was at um, UFC 157, so that's only 49 days ago. Like, really, he, he's, he's right, right back in there, and what an impressive win he had over Ivan Menjivar, a guy who hadn't been submitted in years, in years. And I think that, by the way, that's one of the most interesting things about Uriah Faber. After every single loss he's had, he comes back and he gets a submission win. I really? Think it's insane. Yeah. He's got six losses. The very next fight after every single loss, he submits the guy. Well, wow. Moving on on the card, guys, we have the co-main event of the Ultimate Fighter 17 finalists, Uriah Hall, Kelvin Gasolum. We spoke a lot about them during this week and actually spoke with them on Wednesday's show. That's also available on our iTunes. And Uriah Hall is one of those guys that has come out with just so much hype leading into this. And Gasolum, of course, the, uh, I guess, perennial underdog. Yeah, well, you know, the t they were teammates on the show. And they're fighting in the finale. That's the 11th time in tough history that's happened where the teammates have to fight each other. And we were talking to them the other day. And, uh, Joe, you brought up the fact that, like, you know, it's very rare that you have every guy in the finale, everybody they faced in the house, they finished. Right. It only happened, like, three or four other times. So, you know, you, you got two definite beasts in there. Uriah Hall, the absolute favorite going in. Dana's talked about him so much. You know, we've talked about how much he's loved him and just raves about him. 
but Kelvin Gastelum, underdog of the year and always wins. Do, do you spell that? Do you guys smell that? I smell. I do smell it. I, I smell an upset. You know, stylistically wise, this is a nightmare for Uriah Hall. He's looked amazing. He's been an absolute beast this season. But he's faced guys who are very favorable to his style matchup. You know, he's faced fellow kickboxers that are that are nowhere near his skill level. That he was light years ahead in the striking department. And so he looks. And he is a phenomenal striker, but he looked phenomenal as well. He didn't face any solid wrestlers. And he went with a uh, with an amazing ground game. And, and the one person who did finally try to take him down wasn't a good wrestler, and he was able to take him down and control him. And I'll tell you what. When Uriah hit the ground against Dylan Andrews and Dylan got that takedown in the, in the final fight of the season, he looked lost. And he went for a Kimura. I don't know if he was going for a Kimura or the Kimura sweep. Either one he was doing, he was doing it wrong. The technique was wrong. It was completely wrong. So that just kind of clued me into his IQ when it comes to the ground game. Now, you guys tell me this. Does this story sound familiar? You've got a person coming off the season of the Ultimate Fighter who's got a ton of hype who Dana's talking about, everyone's hyping. He's a kickboxer from New York. He's talking. On, he's taking on a wrestler, an Arizona State wrestler from Yuma, who's a big, huge underdog. Where have we heard this oh, story? Oh, wait, is this not the exact same thing that happened with Felipe Mo Nover and um, Efren Escudero? E Efren Escudero, it's the exact same story. Nover had all this hype. Escudero wasn't gonna win. Escudero from the same places. Nova from New York, he's a kickboxer. Escudero from Yuma, Arizona, the same gym as Kelvin. Kelvin. Yeah. You know, also a, 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 a nationally ranked collegiate wrestler as well. So the parallels are just funny, man. And uh, I, I really think Gels uh, Kelvin's not really getting a lot of, you know, uh, props. He's not, no one's really giving him a shot. And I, I'm just blown away by this because when we look in the history of mixed martial arts and we go back to these style matchups, not mixed martial artist matchups, but style matchups. Striker versus wrestler, kickboxer versus grappler. 95% of the time, it's the grappler that wins. It's the wrestler that wins. So I'm just kind of blown away that no one's really giving him a shot. Well, speaking of wrestlers, we do have two ladies on this card, both of which have uh, huge wrestling backgrounds in Kat Zingano and Misha Tate. And Danny, I'd like to get your input on this one as well, being that I believe Misha used to train with Alpha Male as well earlier in her career. It's the second women's fight in the UFC. She's going up against an undefeated Kat Zingano. She's a former Strike Force champ. What do you think Misha brings to the table in this fight, Danny? Well, being that uh, Misha is a former teammate and I've, I've actually been able to roll with her, uh, I think um, you know her her experience in MMA alone um, in, in big fights uh, is gonna is gonna serve her well. Um, you know, sh she's been a part of the media already. This is uh, Kat's first dance in the big show, and I think. Um, you know, it's going to be too much for her to deal with um, taking pictures, putting makeup on, and then uh, putting those gloves on and and trying to be uh, putting her game face on. So I'm gonna I'm pulling for uh, Misha. It's going to be a wonderful fight, a great fight, and uh, I'm excited for you know the the the, the main card. Uh, I'm excited for the whole card actually. Um, it opens up with some great fights, but uh, it finishes uh, with with my teammate Uriah <laughs> Favor, Team Alpha Male. And what surprises me though about this is Misha is actually an underdog. You know what? It makes sense, though. I mean, honestly, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you why, is that in is that just stylistically, when you look at it on paper, uh, I think Kat has a bigger wrestling uh, 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 pedigree than Misha. She's done more against more people. She's gone further in the sport of wrestling. And I, and I think that also she's shown a stronger skill set on the feet. Her striking is, is very well-rounded, you know. She's got a vicious head kick. She's got great elbows, a great clinch work. She fought professional tie boxing in Thailand and if there was one weakness in the game of Misha Tate it is her striking it, you know you saw Julie Kedsey take full advantage of that she dropped Misha twice you know and Misha's been knocked out by a head kick in the past so you know for Misha to be effective she's gonna have to take this fight to the ground but she's facing someone who potentially could be a better wrestler and so defensively speaking it could be hard for her to get to the ground which means it'll be a stand-up fight which means She's in Cat's world, so yeah. it's just it, it's it makes sense why they did it. If you take out the experience factor and you just look at the skill sets, but you know there is that famous thing called octagon jitters, and you never know mm -hmm. what's going to happen when the bright lights are shining down on you and, and a million people are watching you fight. Yeah, you bring up the the Julie Kedzie fight, and that that's something that you know Misha was already coming off of a loss to Ronda Rousey. She's she's really she's getting manhandled in the fight with Kenzie. But, you know, you saw her come back, and you saw her, her get the submission win late in the fight. You know, big comeback victory. Dana White was there at that event, obviously, because, you know, Scout and Ronda Rousey and the women. And, and he, that was one of the fight of the night. That, that should have, I think it did win fight of the oh, night. Oh, it, it did. did. You know, it was an amazing battle. 
Um, but but Cat, dude, she's seven and zero, oh, seven and zero, oh, and every single fight has ended differently. So she and she had talked about it in a few interviews how you know she's evolving every day and she's learning more and she never goes in there with a game plan and I think that proves it right there. She's won every fight a different manner. Guys, I really want to uh, do this before we head to break here. We do have to hit a break, but we did speak again with Uriah Hall and Kelvin Gastelum on Wednesday, and here's a little bit about what they had to say about facing each other as teammates going into this fight and who really wants to come out the ultimate fighter. We go in there and we'd bang. You know, some of the guys, they'd say, oh, he's going too hard. Well, that's that's fine. You know, I would I would go in and step for, step in for those guys and, and, and go hard with, with, that's with what's Uriah. Up. I think that's how we got along. Yeah. <laughs> well. So so we went in there, we banged, man, and, and he obviously he got a little bit better on the on the stand up and uh and um yeah, man, we we would go in there and we'd bang. It is it, it nothing too crazy, you know, I take him down uh, he was he had good takedown defense for sure. And um yeah, man, he's he's good, he's strong, athletic. Powerful and you know there's, there's nothing else that I can say about that. <laughs> I know Kelvin is is, is strong man. I, I roll with them. You know, uh, wrestling is is amazing. His hands has been improving since you know he he since his first fight. I can't really you know underestimate anything because it's hard to pick out any holes in his game because he's so good at anywhere man. You take him to the floor, he'll fight you. He'll stand up, he'll fight you. He's just constantly growing and because he's young. You know, he has that mindset where he's like, whatever. You know, he'll go out there and like give a hundred percent without even trying because he's that good and he's on that level. And it's something hard to explain. And I don't even think he realizes how good he is. And I give him props for that. But you know, come game day, you know, I'm just gonna go out there and have fun because for me, I keep saying that because that's the only time I can be myself when I have fun. You know, I I can't really say I'm better than this, I'm better than that, and that because I don't really know the outcome. I really don't. When it comes to that time, we have to separate those emotions. We have to put that aside because yeah. it's business. You know, we we both knew that since day one. We possibly have to fight each other. Yeah. And come fight day, since we both made it, you know, we have to separate those emotions. I really don't have anything against him. I love the guy and looking forward to training with him after. But yeah. it's just that day. We just have to kind of put that aside and go out there and bang. I put the pressure onto myself, really. Um, I really want this and I really want to win. So that that's the... The, that's on stake is is this is this UFC contract and that's what I ultimately want, man. Um, but other than that, I I, I I don't feel the pressure, no. And 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 I feel I feel fine. I've already um, I, I'm living my dream right now, man, and I couldn't be any happier. All right, guys, we will get back to breaking down the Ultimate Fighter 17 finale card. That's again at the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas this Saturday. I am Heidi Fang, joined by Joey Varner and Phil Devine, and you are listening to MMA Fight Corner Worldwide on UFCRadio.com and Fox 920 in Las Vegas. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. I'm Heidi Fang, joined by Joey Varner, Phil Devine, and today, very special guest, Danny Castillo. 
We were breaking down here the Ultimate Fighter 17 card, and again, Danny's own teammate from Team Alpha Male, Uriah Faber, is headlining the main event against Scott Jorgensen. We spoke to him yesterday at the open workouts for the Ultimate Fighter 17 finale, and he had a little bit to say about getting on a title run to get back to that belt. To check our egos at the door, understand that this is this is business, and and uh, know that we're both gonna be okay. Like, I don't think he has the capability of killing me, and I don't think I have the ability to kill him. We're too well prepared for that kind of thing. But um, it's gonna be a great fight. I feel like having friends in there competing kind of lets some of the uh, some of the tension off. I mean, I feel like I can really let loose in there, and I think he probably feels the same way. To get to that belt, he's going to have to get through Scott Jorgensen to do it. And again, they were friends. Scott Jorgensen did credit Uriah Faber for helping him get on the more professional side in his career, building it up, learning how to promote, and getting on track to where he is today. So that's going to be a really interesting fight when uh, birds of a feather have to trade leather. But getting back to the card oh here. Oh, I see what you did there. Oh, yeah, I see what I did there. I'm okay. rhyming. So <laughs> We do have Travis Brown and Gabriel Gonzaga in a heavyweight tilt on the card. I'm really excited for this, being that Brown hasn't been in for a while. He c is coming off that loss against Bigfoot. And uh, Gonzaga's on a three-fight win streak. Does Gonzaga still have what it takes, Phil? I don't know. You know what's funny? I think when you look at this, between both guys, they have a combined 35 fights. And with both of them, combined, it's only gone to a judge's decision three times. So both guys go in there. They try to finish, whether they get finished or they try to finish it. It's, they're going in there to, 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 to finish the fight. I got a new nickname for you. It's Little Known Fact Phil. Ah. Because you do, you, you dump these little known facts. Like, did you know that in all the fights history, in every third round, these guys were both cut, and uh, they were able to fight through it, and da 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 I'm like, I did not know that. Well, did you also know that Gonzaga is the third most fights in UFC heavyweight history? Once again, little known fact, Phil strikes again. There you go. And you know what, though? Oh. Napal, I like him. He's on a three-fight win streak. All right? he, he's, he, he's improved, and he's getting better, and he's got his head in the game. But against a guy like Travis Brown, it's going to be tough. Yeah, you know what? I, I just think this is a bad style matchup for Gonzaga. Uh, Gonzaga's a guy who, who, who likes to stand and trade, and but he's slow, and he plods, and he's had trouble with quick guys with good footwork who have long, stiff jabs, and I, I think back to the Brendan Schaub fight. You know, Brendan Schaub was able to pick him, par pick him apart from a distance, and I think that style, Travis Brown, I think is even better than that, that style than Brendan Schaub. He's got better footwork. He's so light. He moves like a welterweight, like a lightweight, and he's a heavyweight. Who, when have you ever seen a heavyweight do a spinning, you know, uh, a spinning cyclone kick to the head of someone? I mean, you know, it was just, he's just so dynamic and athletic. Uh, Gonzaga's bread and butter is, of course, his jiu-jitsu, but he has a ten tendency to neglect it. You know, he likes to stand and trade. He said in the past that he wants to get back to it. He's going to get back to it. But in order to be effective with your jiu-jitsu in a mixed martial arts fight, you got to be able to get to the fight to the mat, and that requires great wrestling. Gonzaga has a decent single leg, but it's decent at best. In order to you be effective with it, he has to be fast enough to close the distance. And he's not very fast. He's kind of flat-footed. And when you have an opponent who's so mobile, who's so quick on their feet, it's hard to get inside on that single leg. You need that person to stop and stand in front of you so you can change those levels, so you can penetrate, get in close on them. And you have to be explosive and fast to do that, which Gonzaga isn't. So, you know, I, I like Travis Brown in this fight, but... You know, Gonzaga has a clear, clear advantage if it does hit the mat. Fourth degree well, black belt. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you 100%. Um, I hate to say this, but it's hard to teach uh, uh, an old dog new tricks. And, um, you know, it seems with the Brazilians, the better the jiu-jitsu, the more they stand and bang. I'm not sure how that goes, but um, I think uh, uh, Travis Scott's awesome footwork. Um, he looked like Dominic Cruz before he was injured in his <laughs> last fight. And um, I think uh, his, his footwork is going to keep him out of trouble. But um, I think it's going to be a short fight. Um, I'm pulling for Travis. It's funny that you say short fight. Brown's had nine first-round knockouts. Or, or three of five. Nine. Did you know? <laughs> and <laughs> hold on, five of them were under a minute, so Wait, it could be quick. You know that NBC thing, like dun, 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 the more you know, the more you know. But we gotta I have that. Produce those we, yeah, we have to have that segue for Phil. Like anytime Phil needs to point to our producer Dave when he's about so to drop. Yeah, hit that. Let's button. do a GI Joe style. And, and, now you know. Know. and now you know. And, and knowing is half the battle. Evil. No, but um, you know what? Yeah, it's on. funny, uh, real quick, Heidi. Uh, sure. you, you touched on the injury. You both touched on the injury. And a lot of times you wonder how a guy is going to rebound from the injury. Well, most people thought it was a knee injury. And knee injuries, a lot of times for a fighter, are hard to come back from. You know, King Mo Luol said himself, like, he's had a couple of knee surgeries. And
and coming back he doesn't feel the same you know it's hard to really plant it's hard to drive off that he doesn't have the same confidence level in that knee but Travis Brown it wasn't actually a knee injury it was a torn hamstring which mm -hmm. is something that you come back from 100 percent it's it, there's no there's not a lot of likeliness a, a, of a reoccurring injury to take place so I, I don't think that'll play any any factor into this fight one bit coming back from knee surgery is awful I've done it three times and it's very hard to get but back. you still yeah. fight <laughs> Phil I still do what I can all right guys now we have another ultimate fighter 17 matchup with Bubba McDaniel and Gilbert Smith Jamal so um, you know speaking of injuries how does Bubba come back from a broken orbital bone, broken nose, and all that, and just the anxiety that overwhelmed him mentally against Uriah Hall and come back to be in this finale? We have these two together. It's very interesting because we didn't get to see very much of Gilbert Smith. He lost so early in the competition, and we didn't really get to see much out of him in that. Uh, what do you guys think about this matchup? I thought it was really nice that you didn't say broken spirit about Bubba because that was definitely something that happened on the show too. Uh, you know, he was one and two on the show. He did have the one win against Kevin Casey, but he also did lose twice. Uh, but you but gotta, but, but you gotta take into consideration uh, that one pe a lot of people don't understand is the anxiety of being on the show. There's, there's, and it's not being on the show because the camera's there. It's just that whole atmosphere. You know, every single fighter I've ever talked to from that show said it's the most anxiety-inducing experience in your life. They were so uncomfortable. They were so anxious. They just, they could not wait to get out of that show. And so, I don't know how much of, I, I don't think Bubba has ever had that in, in his career, in his life. You know, you look at his record. He's been fighting for a long been time. Been fighting since 20, he, he, he was beating the hell out of Alexander Slamenko, the Bellator uh, middleweight champion. You know, before he got caught with a flying knee to the ribs, I think it was. Um, you know, but he was completely dominating him. So I, I don't know about the, if the anxiety will play a role in this. But go ahead, Phil. No, yeah, he's 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 a pro. But I, I think it's funny you're bringing up the anxiety. But was it the house? Or was it Uriah Hall? I think it was a well, combo. Danny, you were a coach on that season when uh, Faber and Cruz were actually on the show. So what do you think? Is it a lot of anxiety? And that was the longer season, I, uh, too. Yeah, 16 yeah, weeks. Oh, man, weeks. It, was, it was forever. I had a blast. Um, I, I think the anxiety uh, plays a, a huge role. Um, you know, I have 20 fights. And, um, you know, the last couple of weeks coming down to the fight, is, is it's just a weird 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 time for me because all the hard work's done you know I'm confident but at the same time there's a lot of anxiety I'm nervous anytime you have thousands of dollars at risk um, you know your and heart thousands kinda, of people watching you and, right and your heart kind of drops down in your stomach um, I have good support system so I can go to my mom's house I can go <laughs> to a buddy's house um, I, I, I can do stuff take my dog for a walk but when you're locked in that house with other fighters that you can't stand it just Non-stop turn around and there's fighters that's got to be tough to deal with you have no one to talk to you can't call home and, and, and talk to a buddy um, before every fight I have a friend that actually leaves me a voicemail it's something that's it's happened for a while and it's basically you've been beating people up your whole life this is no different there's just people there um, you know keep your chick your chin tucked and um, you know throw like if it was a fight in the street so those are something that my buddies give me and um, you know sometimes it's not the best I advice but uh, you know coming from a friend it's it's definitely um you know, motivating. It helps awesome. diffuse those butterflies, right? Definitely. Relax. And, and, and one thing as well is, though, is just not the anxiety s that, that you deal with, but when you're in a room, you feed off the energy of other people. Mm -hmm. If I come into the room and everyone's pissed, you know, I'm going to feel it. If I come in the room and everyone's happy and laughing, suddenly I'm in a better mood. You come in the room and everyone's on edge and anxious, you're going to feel it. And that feeling gets amplified because it, it responds to everyone else's feeling in the room. And so you've got this feeling, but then also every single person you look at, you might have to fight. <laughs> so you've got this feeling, you're laughing with this guy, and as you're talking, hanging out with this guy in the back of your head, you're like, man, I might have to fight you. What is he? Okay, what, how would I beat this guy? And then, then the, 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 the wheels start turning, the juices start flowing. Boop, there goes the, the, the heart straight into the stomach. The nerves are fired up, and you're sitting there. You've got the fight or flight system raging through your veins. You feel like you're about to step in the cage right now, and you're sitting on a couch in a freaking house. Yeah, it's a very weird concept. You're in an individual sport, but you're on teams. And, and to have to be in there and train together, but knowing, you know, see outside of it, you know that, hey, listen, I train with a camp. I'm not fighting the guy in my camp. I'm not fighting a guy that I train with every day. He's like my brother. But in the house, it's totally different. You're training with guys that you, you know you may have to fight. And we had talked to Uriah Hall about that the other day. And he was saying how, you know, some people took him being a, as a dick on the show or going too hard. It was, he wanted to let everyone know, hey, man, I may have to fight you. And I want you to know that when you get in there with me, you're in for a world of hurt. 
And so it, it's a it's a very weird concept. I think well, the message was received loud and clear. Absolutely, <laughs> dude. But absolutely. Well, let's move on to then another fight here where we have Josh Salmon. Salmon, sorry. Um, <laughs> one of the guys that Uriah wanted to fight. He's not going to get to fight him. And he's facing Kevin the King Casey. But they call him the King, but this guy couldn't come up to answer the bell against Bubba. See, this is the one thing that bothers me about Kevin Casey. He did lose two times on the show. He wasn't stopped on the show. Technically, he wasn't stopped. He didn't answer the bell after the second round. Or was it the first round? No, it was the second, second. round because we thought it may, it's going to go to a he third. He dominated the top exactly. position in the first. and then. But the one thing I don't like is he's been a pro for seven years, and he's only had seven fights. And we're questioning his heart on the show. I'm questioning how much does he really want to be a fighter. I, 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 that's the one thing in the question. Josh, we know what he wants. We know he's a fighter. He goes in there to fight. He finishes his fights. He's been a pro for a while, all right, you know. But I think his weakness is Kevin Casey's strength. So if Casey can have heart, this fight's a lot better. Yeah, you know, and, but it goes a lot of ways because, you know, Kevin Casey, he, he does have a strong jiu-jitsu ground game. But a lot of things that concern me with his ground game is it's more pure jiu-jitsu than jiu-jitsu for, for MMA. MMA. You know, he was fighting with a closed guard. He was holding him closed guard. He was doing things that you do in a jiu-jitsu tournament, but that aren't applicable in a mixed martial art fight. They're not really effective. <clears throat> that being said as well, you know, in order for him to be dominant and to get the fight where he wants to fight, he needs one skill set that I talked about in the Gazaga breakdown. That's wrestling. He's not a good wrestler. He's short and stocky, but he doesn't really change levels. He fights from the tie up, and he's fighting a guy who's who's long, strong, who's got good power. You know, who I think is a lot stronger. Um, you know, we we saw Josh Saman's weakness on the show. Of course, uh, Jimmy Quinlan was able to take him down, but he reversed and stopped him. But when Kelvin got him down, you know, he did almost look kind of lost for a second. Not lost, just not on point. Not as not at that level uh, uh, of jujitsu as as Kelvin. Uh, but I don't know if Kevin Case is going to be able to get to the, the fight to the ground, and I don't know if it's four and a half minutes in or round two. Not just heart, because I think before the heart goes, the fatigue goes, the conditioning goes. You know, and they say fatigue makes cowards of us all. Well, I think that's why the heart leaves Kevin Casey, because he does get fatigued, and then he just kind of goes back to his closed guard jiu-jitsu mindset. How and hard is that? Thing. That's tough. Sorry. That's tough. And another thing about Josh Saman is, will he be 100%? He had a lot of issues, um, thought he had blood clots. I guess that's a problem for him. He's had them in the past. He almost lost his leg. It kept him out of the first time he was in the Ultimate Fighter. So we'll have to see who comes in also at 100%. With, with, that, with that injury thing, though, a lot of that has to do with the fact that in you're fighting four times in 12 weeks. That's a fight every three weeks. Danny. Uh, you know how that is. Just doing a fight in, in after eight weeks, your body's beat to hell. But can you imagine turning around after eight weeks well, a, a, of a training camp and, and then turn around and fight again? Well, I've been known to take uh, fights on <laughs> short notice. So, uh, you should be called short uh, notice, Danny Castillo. <laughs> uh, but he brings up a good point. Um, seven fights in seven years. Comfort uh, plays a huge factor inside that cage when you're all alone with another guy. Uh, as soon as we come back from break uh we are <laughs> mma fight quarter on ufcradio.com and also on fox sports 920 
MMA Fight Corner. Fight Corner. Live from the Fox Sports 920 studio in Las Vegas. And streaming worldwide on UFCRadio.com. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. I'm Heidi Fang, joined by Joey Varner, Phil Devine, and our special guest, UFC lightweight Danny Lascol Castillo. Guys, we are here on the to- tough ultimate fun. I-, I can't get that out. The it's Ultimate tough. Fighter 17. It is tough. Ah, <laughs> you see what I did there? 17 season finale card. Uh, where were we left off? We are up to the fight with Luke Barnett, who is 6'6", fighting at middleweight versus Colin Hart. Uh, Barnett lost to Andrews in that last fight uh, where they showed Andrews the picture of his family. He gets that warrior spirit, and all of a sudden, he is just unleashing on Barnett. I have to say, though, with Hart, where he's concerned, I wasn't completely impressed with him and everything that came behind him. He was picked a little earlier in the show. I mean, he had a hard-fought loss also, but um, I don't know. I think I give Barnett the edge here. What do you guys think? Yeah, you know, G- Gilbert looked pretty. Um, you were no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Gilbert got knocked out by Luke yes. in the fight. That, that was the very first fight on the show, wasn't he it? And he couldn't take down yeah. Luke down. Yeah, um, but and Colin, you know, he's a tough dude. This, this is. I think this is one of those pick 'em fights. You know, both guys that you really don't know much about them. They don't have a lot of experience, so they kind of go. They're going in there. I think uh, Colin is the better wrestler. I think uh, Luke's the better striker. Uh, I, it's a tough fight to call. This this fight and the next fight, Dylan Andrews, Jimmy Quinlan, are the same. You've got a better striker taking on a better grappler. Now, a lot of times, I said earlier, when the striker grappler matchup, you know, happens, it, it leans towards the grappler. In this case, you know what? I like Luke over Colin. Um, first of all, Colin got knocked out. You know, mm-hmm. he got knocked out, and I'm always wondering, you know, when a guy gets knocked out like he did, because he took a, he went limp. You know, it wasn't like it was a, he got rocked, he and then a barrage kind of, right. and the referee stopped. Lights were it out. Was like, no, he got separated from consciousness, and we know Luke Barnett has the ability to separate someone from consciousness. Another thing with Barnett is he's so long, he's so long, and he utilizes footwork, okay? And he was able to do that against a short, compact wrestler in Gilbert Smith in the tough cage. Well, the tough cage is the old WEC cage. Smaller. It's 10 feet smaller. So now we're talking about a 34 by 34 foot space that you can move around in. That just favors his style of fighting. And the way Colin kind of rushes in with his chin up to get the takedown, and he does have better wrestling, but he only wrestled for a year in high school, so he doesn't have great wrestling. Just so he, still, he, still makes, <laughs> he still makes mistakes with his wrestling. Now, he does have the clear advantage in the jiu-jitsu game, but will his chin last long enough for him to get it to the mat? And is his offensive wrestling better than the defensive wrestling of Luke Barnett? I think Luke's defense is better than his offense, and I think Luke has lights out power, so I'm going with what is it? Big slow? Yeah, yeah. big slow. Big, big slow. slow. Uh, Danny, you, you made a, a weird facial expression there when Joey yep. said one year of high school wrestling. Does one year of high school wrestling cut it in MMA today? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Uh, one year in high school wrestling might uh, serve you well in a bar fight. Um, <laughs> but uh, might <laughs> until your buddies until t- t- his buddies jump in and they start kicking you when you're on top. Yeah, I just um, you know I've been wrestling half of my life and it's still one of the toughest, hardest sports to learn. Um, and uh, you know it's it's helped me in a lot of fights, get me out of a lot of trouble. But um, you know a year of high school wrestling. It, that's that's nothing. Uh, I, I don't think that should even be a factor. We shouldn't even be talking about him <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> on a side note, does it make it more impressive, you know, taking that in consideration that one year of high school doesn't really, ma- if you've never wrestled, you know, it doesn't do a lot. And if you have one year, it's not a lot. Does it make it more impressive what GSP's done? That he's never wrestled before. Um, you know, I think GSP's the best fighter in the world. I'm I think, with you. Um, if, if he were to fight uh, the spider, you know, a lot of people may not agree with me, but I think his ability to take the fight anywhere is, um, you know, is, is phenomenal. He's, he's very athletic. He's a true professional. His wrestling is, his takedowns are hard to stop. And, um, you know, submissions, when's the last time that guy's ever, has he ever been submitted? Yeah, Once. Matt Hughes yeah, one. Matt Hughes, Matt if your name's right. not Matt, you're not beating GSP. Right. Like, absolutely. <laughs> but who's, tonight? who's got two thumbs and agrees with what you're saying? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Well, we also have another wrestler going against, uh, not really a striker, but maybe a jack-of-all-trades, master of nothing, and Dylan Andrews versus Jimmy Quinlan. I love Andrews just because of his heart and what we've seen out of him. I'm happy to see him uh, again uh, back in the you know, cage against somebody that he had on the show, Jimmy Quinlan. He's a grinder, a very strong wrestler. Uh, for me, this is one of the harder fights to pick between the two of them skill set wise. You know, you look at this, and I think the one thing that y- this fight, the standout, is the experience factor. Jimmy Quinlan's been fighting pro for just under two years. He's only had three fights. 
Dylan, a Dylan Andrews, you're looking at him, and he may be on the Ultimate Fighter right now, but he's had over like 20 pro fights, and he's been in there with guys like Shoney Carter, okay, Brian Ebersol, uh, Jesse Taylor, one of the would, who may have been a winner if he didn't screw up on the Ultimate Fighter. So he's been in there before. He, this is, you know, and the one thing we saw from him this this year was heart, heart, miles and miles of heart. Let me ask you this. How did he lose to Jesse Taylor, to Brian Ebersell, even to Shoney Carter? It was it was the wrestling. And Shoney okay. Carter can't wrestle his way up here. No, back. he beat Shoney Carter. Oh, no, he beat him. Sorry, sorry, you're right. Yeah, no, it was, it's, he, yes, that Jesse Taylor submitted him, I think. And Took I him think, down and controlled him. <laughs> and I think Ebersell beat him by, you know, uh, that went to a decision. But I'm telling you, I, I think Quinlan, just, I don't think he has enough experience being on the big stage like that. Yeah, he's, a, he's got great jiu-jitsu. He's got good takedowns. But I think, I think Dylan is, uh, it's got the heart, man. It's all heart for me on this one. Yeah. You know what? This is like the, this is so similar to uh, my assessment of the Barnett Colin Hart fight, but in reversed. Um, you know, Dylan's, Dylan has a ton of heart. He's a good striker. He's solid. Not great. Doesn't have that devastating one punch power, but he's got some pop. But he's got a big hole in his game. He's got a big deficiency with the ground game. And we saw Jimmy, you know, take down Josh and, and dominate him for most of the round. And then when Josh reversed it, he kind of succumbed to the pressure of those strikes. He kind of, you know, he kind of tapped out prematurely. Kind of like the exact opposite of what he had done to Clint Hester. Well, that's and what I was going to say yeah. because I, I thought that was, you know, just it was, his again, his third fight in, in, in seven weeks, you know, and he had just fought it. He was beaten up because he took down. Hester at will. He dominated Hester, but Hester beat on him. He beat on his body. He really hurt him. And so I think Jimmy was still feeling effects of that fight when he went in against um, Josh Man. But those were clobbering punches. They were <laughs> vicious. You, you heard him echoing through through the through the whole uh, auditorium. You through know, his rib cage that went hollow because all the bones were broken. Yeah, but I don't <laughs> think I don't think Dylan Andrews is a good enough defensive wrestler, and I don't think he's anywhere the near the level of a striker as. Um, Clint Hester. I think Clint's bigger, stronger, hits way harder, and I, and I really think that you know he the way he dominated Clint on the ground. I think he'll be able to do it with Dylan. I think he's going to come out there, you know, jab, 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 change levels, double leg, and then just hug him and position, calculated position, slowly pass from guard to half guard, continue to go to side control, go to mount. Dylan will give up his back, you know, and, and maybe defend a choke for the first round. It'll end like that. I think the second round he'll catch him in a sub. Well, let's talk about that fight with Clinton Hester. It's actually going up against Bristol Marunde. He's a local Las Vegas guy here. He was on the Ultimate Fighter 16, but he didn't get to fight in the quarterfinals. He had lost to uh, Neil Magny on the show. Um, he has to prove himself. He has another shot here, but like you said, he's going up against a heavy hitter in Clint Hester. Um, Clint Hester eliminated by Jimmy Quinlan on this season, but... Did Hester's inept ground game get exposed? Well, there's, there's another question you got to wonder about this. Because who's missing from this fight card from the ultimate Zach fight? Cummings. Zach Cummings. So this fight was supposed yeah. to be Zach Cummings. So what you got to wonder is, and since they just released the card late because of the ultimate fighter had to had to end before they can release it, when was this fight made? When did right. Zach was Zach Cummings scheduled originally, and he got hurt a week ago? How short notice of this? How much time did Bristol have to really prepare for this fight? The question. last time he's fought in a sanctioned fight because the Ultimate Fighter obviously not sanctioned was, was against, against uh, Jacques, Jacques Array. Array. Loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, he did very well against Jacques Array. He showed heart. He showed a lot of heart in that fight. But I, I just think you know Bristol, and I love Bristol, man. He's my buddy. Um, I think he does. He's kind of he's okay everywhere, but not good anywhere. Is it, and I'm not not ripping on him. He's a, he's a, he's an okay. He has okay takedowns. They're not really they're not really pure wrestling takedowns. They're more like MMA takedowns. I, I learned how to change levels and I can drive a little bit. Um, he's got you know weird kind of striking. He's really square, sits down, you know, and kind of throws a lot of awkward punches. But it's not really great striking, you know. So and he's got decent submission offensively and defense, but it's not great, you know. And he's taking on Clint Hester, who is great. In one area, he's a great boxer. Oh, he's yeah. a great yeah. kickboxer. That's where he started, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, correct. Professional boxing, you know, and then got into kickboxing and MMA. But, you know, and his, but his takedown defense against a great wrestler is suspect. Now, against a decent wrestler, how will it be? You know, um, I, I think he's got the clear advantage in the stand-up game. But there's questions on, on you know, the, the proficiency of his takedown defense and the how long of a training camp did Bristol have? And Bristol only had two weeks to get ready for this fight. Took it on short notice. You know, he's jumped at the opportunity to get in the UFC. 
uh, will he have the gas to finish a takedown? And to take, because remember when uh, uh, Jimmy Quinlan shot in those takedowns? Hester sprawled out, and Jimmy was under him, and Hester was doing the old, you know, Phil Baroni versus Matt Linlin, just <laughs> ripping on his body. But he made Baroni's punches look like pillow shots, you know. He was just ripping so bad. Well, if that's the scenario here, will Bristol have the conditioning to recover from that, still finish the takedown, still come out strong and fresh enough to finish the takedown in the second round? All I know is I want Dave, our producer, I need you to get sound bites of Clint Hester's oh body punches, yeah. and they need to be constantly added in, as the drops in the <laughs> show, because those were some nasty bangs. I'm not even doing it justice, <laughs> but let's get to those a couple of fights. Those were some fight. nasty bangs. It's like being, so a, it's like, it's like being a lonely <laughs> they, man they, when they, you come to <laughs> the cage. They were brutal. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> goodness. Let's get to a couple of fights I want to get Danny's input on that are on the Facebook card, because you know he, like I said, was an assistant coach when Uriah Faber was on the old Ultimate Fighter, and th albeit both of these guys were on Team Cruise, but I'm sure you've got to get to know them a little bit uh, since then, being that I think the winner of your season, Michael Chiesa, his boy Sam Cecilia, is fighting Maximo Blanco, uh, Maximo Blanco on the uh, Facebook prelims there. Maximo Blanco! Blanco! And Cecilia is very, very heavy-handed. Uh, what are your thoughts on him, even though he was on Team Cruise? Have you got to see a little bit of him since then? Yeah, I, I like Sam. He's he's a good guy. Um, actually, everyone on the show were were, were really good guys. Um, I liked them all. Um, with this fight, it, it, it's hard to call. I, I think uh, Maximo has a, a lot more experience. Um, you know, in, 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 in prior fights, I've seen Sam Cecilia gas. Um, so I, I don't really know how this is going to play out. What I do know is... Um, you know they've had he's had a lot of time to improve and i know that he was out at uh at the lab with benson henderson and a bunch of uh, talented fighters so um fighters change um from month to month i think i'm a different fighter from my last fight and that was only two months ago so it's going to be interesting to see i'm pulling for sam cecilia uh he has a tough fight but um you know i i, I want sam to win it's good it's interesting how you say how he, how he comes out he always comes out full force you know, and that is the one question, is his cardio, because he goes balls to the walls right away. How long can he keep it up? Well, you know what else yeah, You know what else concerns me with Sam Cecilia? Is he fights with his hands at his waist. Yep. He has good footwork. He dances in and out, but his hands are at his waist, and he does gas. He's taking on Maximo Blanco, who's a southpaw. He's not just a southpaw. He's a violent striker with a good wrestling pedigree. I mean, he won the Pan Am. I think he took second at the Pan Am Games. You know, he has the bigger wrestling pedigree of the two. He's got more tools in his in his arsenal, more, more tools at his disposal than Sam Cecilia. Now, when you are dancing around with your hands at your waist coming in and out and you're fighting a southpaw, you're exposed to that big le left head kick. And Maximo Blanco throws that big left head kick and knees violently precise with accuracy. Um, so it just seems like they're they're similar in their violent attacks, you know, mm -hmm. offensively. But Cecilia's just got some holes in his game that if he didn't fix, Blanco will take advantage of. Well, let's hit on Justin Lawrence just a little bit here before we <laughs> go to break. What, do you want to meet him at a bar? You want to hit on Justin I, Lawrence? Maybe. I'd love to. I don't know. He's the American out. kid, hey, can I buy you a drink? He's not really my type. Come here often? <laughs> I don't think he's <laughs> old enough to get in a bar. Yeah, I think he is. I think he is uh, probably because he probably wouldn't be able to fight, I guess, in a casino with something like that uh, Bellator thing that <laughs> happened. But uh, you know about uh, Justin Lawrence also, Danny. He was on the same season, if I'm not mistaken. And that kid was touted. I mean, he was saying, like, he had all these amateur fights. And he came into the, uh, I think, the finale and against Max Holloway, just got pounded against and body shots and just dropped. What do you think about this fight against uh, Daniel Pineda for him? I think you can't really... Um take into consideration that fight i think um you know that kid's uh that kid's awesome um a uh, max, max you know, i think, he's, yeah. I think mm -hmm. he's something special and i think uh, he's gonna have a big name for himself justin lawrence is a phenomenal striker um it, it's just gonna it's it's basically um comes down to daniel's uh, ability to take the fight to the ground um i, I think he has a, a definite advantage in that in that in that area and, um, you know, I, I'm pulling for Justin Lawrence. I like the kid. He trains at Alliance, and he's good friends with uh, my buddy, J uh, Jeremy Stevens. So. One thing I like, that this is the second time only since Pineda's been in the UFC that he has a full training camp. Remember, he came in last January, took a fight on short notice. His first Carvalho. four fights his four first four fights in the UFC were, on sh uh, were in seven months. Seven, seven fights in four months. I mean, four fights in seven months. Three of them were on short notice. 
So it's not like he he's actually finally has time to prepare for a fight, and it's been a while since we've seen him, and I'm sure he's made some adjustments, but I agree, he definitely has the advantage on the ground. Well, let's get back to all of that and more, but right now, before we leave you, I wanted to get to this uh, Kat Zingano clip that we got yesterday at the Ultimate Fighter Open Workouts. She was talking about the opportunity for women on the table to be in the main card on the top 17 finale on Saturday. I think that this is definitely some of the best talent that will be seen in the UFC history. You know, girls have a lot more to bring that hasn't been seen before based on, you know, our center of gravity is different, our intensity is different, um, you know, just our, our overall skills are, are, are changed, you know, I mean, a lot of moves that wouldn't work for guys sometimes work for girls and vice versa, so I think it's a good change of pace and it'll be definitely a nice new scene. All right, everybody, we'll come back with some interesting talk with Danny Castillo after the break. We are on UFCRadio.com and on Fox 920 in Las Vegas. We'll be right back. MMA Fight Corner. Fight Corner. Live from the Fox Sports 920 studio in Las Vegas. And streaming worldwide on UFCRadio.com. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. We are live on UFCRadio.com and on Fox 920 in Las Vegas. We will get back to there's one last fight we have to break down on that card. But first I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a listen of something that we talked to Misha Tate about yesterday. Obviously, she lost her belt to Ronda when she was in strike force, and now that she's in the UFC, she's back on track trying to get at that title again. Becoming a champion means more to me than anything, more than a rematch, more than anything. Because that's something that when I'm 80 years old someday and I have kids and grandkids, I can look back and say, look, this is, this is what I did. This is my accomplishment. So that's my ultimate goal. Again, that was a former teammate of Team Alpha Male, and we do have Team Alpha Male's Danny Last Call Castillo in studio. You signed a big fight yesterday, Danny, with Bobby Green. He's also a former Strike Force fighter. We saw what he did, he did against Jacob Volkman at UFC 156. Um, did you get a chance to see that fight, and what do you think about Bobby Green and what he brings into this fight? I was actually at that fight. Um, you know, I saw it live. Uh, he, um, you know, he did a great job. He's a big, big, strong dude. Um, so I take that in consideration. Um, you know, I might put a little bit more emphasis in my weightlifting. Um, although I feel strong, um, you know, I'm in great shape right now. This camp is going to be really fun because all the hard work is done. I'm waking up at a heart rate of like 42. Um, my weight's, uh, you know, 167. So this is, uh, is going to be just technique for this camp. It's the first time, you know, I'm al always running, always cycling, always worried about being in shape, but right now I'm in shape, so th it, it's going to be a fun fight for me. Um, Bobby Green is going to be a good test for me, and, um, you know, I, I, I'm not looking past him, but, um, you know, I've been finding some of the best guys in the world, even in the WC. It's, it's obvious because uh, the champ is from the WC, the top guys in the in the top five in the lightweight division are in the WC and I've been fighting those guys um, since the beginning of my career so I feel like I, I faced um, you know better opponents and um, you know I'm a true professional right now I've never been so focused in my life like I am right now well, you're four and one in your last five I mean you're one of them in the one of the most competitive divisions in the UFC what'll it take for you to finally crack that top ten 
hopefully a big win over Bobby Green. Um, you know, I'd like to finish. I'm just like anyone. You know, you go to work eight hours, and if you can get out in five hours, you're happy as 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 heck. Um, <laughs> so you know, if if I can get out in the first round, then I'll be really happy. And um, you know, I, I, I'm just focused on 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 Bobby Green and. Uh, having a successful fight and um, coming out with my hand raised. And like you said, the conditioning that you've been doing is off the charts. I've been seeing some of it on Twitter with the kettlebells and you are got the chains on you and seems like you're doing some lunges and some pull-ups with all of that. How much of a role is that playing into this training camp and getting prepared for this fight? It's tough to say. You know, m a lot of people might say, oh, that's going to help him a lot. But uh, where I think it's helping me the most is my mental state. Um, y you know, I, I feel like when I go into that fight, I, I've already done everything I need to do. Now I, I just get to work with uh, my head coach, uh, Dwayne Ludwig. Um, he's putting together awesome game plans for all our fighters. Right now, um, at Team Alpha Male is undefeated this year um, with with uh, Coach Bang um, as head coach. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good time for me. You know, I, I'm really excited. Uh, I always say that, but, um, you know, the, there's nothing else I, I – I, there's no other word I can explain of, of the feeling that I have right now. Everything's coming together as a whole. I'm a better person, um, you know, outside of the cage, which makes me a better fighter inside the cage. How much does that help you, though? Is You know, we talked about going in there with nerves and pressure and dealing with all that stuff. When, you know, there's always that, you know, I don't want to get tired. I think that's I think every fighter's deep, darkest fear is getting tired in the cage. Because when you're tired, you know, you're almost helpless. They say fatigue makes cowards of us all. They and say it's the worst it, feeling. It, it, I tell you what, it, it, it is absolutely because you feel almost helpless. And the fear of that happening is even worse. But when you know that now one of your greatest strengths is your conditioning, you know, what does that do for your confidence level? It, it, it does a lot. Um, you know, being tired in our room is is the worst feeling you can you can ever experience because you know I train with a better team one of the best lightweight teams in the world and if you're tired in that room um, you know it could be a long day and um, you can leave that uh, leave that practice room pretty banged up so um, you know <laughs> is that a throw out to bang your coach <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah that is uh, yeah I, I think that um, you know being a fighter and and being this is I've had 20 fights one of the things that uh, has helped me the most is um, coming to the fact and the realization that you're going to be tired it's a fight you're giving everything you have um, you know you just got to be able to deal with being tired and, and be mentally strong because um, there's you're going to be tired it's it's there's no way around it. If and about, uh, if ands or about it, you're going to be tired. So um, I want to be entire. I want to be tired with my hands up and ready to go to the next round, no matter how many rounds we go. Right. And, and, and speaking about going to the next round, when, when you're taking on Bobby Green, what are the, what are the holes you see in his game now? What are the things you're looking to exploit in, in his game? I, I feel like I'm a faster, uh, faster fighter than he is. Um, I'm a better wrestler than his, and my jiu-jitsu is, feel, uh, is is feeling phenomenal lately. Um, I fought uh, a big player jiu-jitsu. Um, with Paul Sass and everyone was just, you know, I, I don't know, as soon as the fight was announced, I'm going to get triangled, mm -hmm. you're going to get triangled. We all picked you to win. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. You guys are fantastic. Except Heidi. Heidi picked Sass. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. I figured. Uh, I, don't, I don't blame her. Uh, I got it on paper, actually. because she's I so sassy. Not. I, I don't blame her. Uh, I'm a big underdog in the lightweight division, and, and I walk around with a chip on my shoulder. And, um, you know, that some people say it's a bad thing. For me, it's a good thing because uh, – you know, uh, I get no, I get no respect, I get no credit, but um, you know, in the back of my head, I keep pushing and, and keep trying to prove all the lightweight fighters wrong and um, all the media wrong. Hey, hey, re real quick, I just want one more, one more quick question. Uh, you know, you got the nickname Last Call because you know you were outraging, you know, until the last call. You know, we partied with you before, and now you cut out partying completely. You thought about switching your nickname at all? Um, no, not at all, because um, th there's an underlying meaning also. Um, I made a promise to my mother when I was uh, in high school that I was winning a state title. Didn't happen. Uh, I promised her at the junior college level I win a state title. Didn't happen. Um, at the national level, I, I took second, and it didn't happen also. So this is kind of my last call to give her okay. to, <laughs> to stay true to, to, to that promise that I made her. Beautiful. I like that meaning much better than the other one. Yeah, yeah. I, next month would be a year sober, the longest I've been sober since I started drinking. So I, I feel good. Uh, you know, m my head is clear, and, uh, you know, there's a sense of clarity that I've never had before. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, I'm starting to get my personality back without beers, you know. It, 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 that's something hard to do when you don't have a shot of crown, you know. Like, whoa, there goes that. The personality's <laughs> back. I'm having a great time, and, and I can be around people drinking and not have the temptation because being a champ is what I want the most. And, um, you know, you have to make sacrifices in any 
aspect of life. That reminds me of an old show where there was a guy who was drunk all the time, and they were like, I think they called him Fun Bobby, and he stopped drinking, and they were like, well, we know why Fun Bobby was called Fun Bobby. What show was that? I don't remember, I've but it's sti- it's so f- it was so funny. It was like the dude had zero personality, and that, that's got to be hard when you're used to going out and you're used to being in social situations when you're, you know, like inhibitions thrown to the wind, and now you go out there and you're a responsible adult. So things are a lot different. Well, I, I, I feel like I'm getting more calls to go hang out because I'm the sober driver. <laughs> 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 so that, that's always fun, and um, I'm definitely a cheap date, you know, a, a water, uh, and uh, that, that's all I need. But um, being, um, you know, I, I, I never thought I'd, I'd be sober, but um, as long as I'm fighting professionally, I, I'm just going to remain sober. And, uh, you know, the, the, the positives has, have, uh, have uh, out, out – um, there's no more negatives in my life right. um, yep. as far as I, as far as I'm concerned. So um, it's a good thing. And, um, you know, anyone who's pro fighter, I, I recommend the same thing. Uh, Joey's seen it here. You've lived here in Vegas for a while, Joey, and that's one of the things you see. You see guys with all the talent in the world, and it doesn't matter. If you go out and party and don't take care of yourself or, or act responsibly, it's going to show in the cage. That was me early on, man, me and Tompkins. I'd be out raging all night, show up at the gym, you know, get to, get to bed at 4 a.m., show up at 10 a.m., <coughs> and sweating out the booze training and I was always injured because of it now I'm like almost two years I haven't drank and just you uh-huh. know just because uh-huh. I same thing I, I, I want to wake up fresh in the morning to train I don't want to hold myself back I don't want to have that negative impact on myself because it affects your diet it affects your training it affects everything so it, it's the way to go just a couple more questions for you Danny before we wrap it up here how much has Dwayne Bang talked to you guys about maybe wanting to just stay at the coaching level and not come back to fighting as far as getting in there professionally and uh, I guess doing what he does. Dwayne's a complete, uh, I mean, he's totally professional. It, it's amazing to have a coach that works just as hard as me. Um, you know, that that's so motivating. When I go in the gym, he's there watching film. When I leave the gym, he's still there uh, watching film. Um, we don't really talk about his, his, his what he's going to do when his knee's healed up. Um, mm-hmm. Right now, he's completely focused on, on making Team Alpha Male the best team in the world. And right now, um, you know, it's obvious that he's doing something right because we're, we're 4-0 in the cage and we got four fights coming up. So, um, you know, all the fights that are coming up, I, I feel like we can win. Joseph Benavidez, TJ Dillashaw, Chad Mendez, Uriah Faber, we can all win. We, those guys can win those fights and will win those fights. So we'll be 8-0. Um, in the UFC um, next week, and it'll be an awesome feeling. What, what's absolutely amazing about Team Alpha Male is that you did all of this in the past without a real head coach and a real trainer that was dedicated to everybody and, and just the team. So now that you have that, I can't wait to see what the future holds for this team. Well, again, Danny will be fighting Bobby Green at UFC on Fox 8. That's in Seattle's Key Arena on July 27th. Also signed to that card, Jake Ellenberger versus Roy McDonald. Love it. Tarek Safadine versus Robbie Lawler. And Melvin Gillard versus Mac Danzig. Uh, thank you, Danny, so much right now for the interview.